Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. Good evening, everybody, and, and thank you very much indeed, uh, Ian, for the introduction and indeed for the invitation to come and um, offer some ideas to you, which I hope are backed up by some evidence as, as well. Um, I want, I want, some people end off talks by um, offering their indebtedness and thanks. I want to start off. Uh, by thanking uh, some people. Um, I edit something called the James Lind Library, which is a, a web-based library, and much of the material in it, almost all of it actually, thinking about it, um, comes from the Sybil Library, this wonderful library that this college has been charged with looking after. And these days, that's quite a challenge uh, with um, cost pressures and uh, other things. And yet this college, and I'm particularly grateful actually to someone who isn't here, Neil Dewhurst, for being particularly important in helping the library to um, go from strength to strength. Now this um, uh, James Lid Library um, basically contains material explaining, um, in, in fact in seven languages I think, and illustrating the development of fair tests of treatments in, in healthcare. Um, going back to um, the Egyptian papyri, in fact. And um, as you'll see down there on the left, um, it actually got a prize uh, when it was launched. It was. Um, uh, one of five medical websites to get the prize from the Scientific American, and the only one to have been established outside America. So uh, those of us involved in it feel rather chuffed about that. I'm going to assume that you actually don't need any introduction to James Lind and what he did. Um, but these are the people who uh, have been behind the growth of the James Lind Library. Alfredo Moravia, uh, Ulrich Treller, Ian Milne, um, um, myself, Estella Ducan, who's at the um, back of the room, George Tate, who was responsible for designing the software for it, and Jan van der Broeke. And uh, at least um, three um, of those people are fellows of, of the college. So, James Lind, who is this Scottish um, naval surgeon, well known particularly because he had described a control trial designed to find out which of the opinions about how to treat scurvy was likely to be correct. And until very recently, this engraving was the only image that we had of him. It was based on a painting done by someone called Sir George Chalmers. And my cousin John, who's sitting over there, um, was very kind. I asked him to look into Sir George Chalmers to find out a little bit about him. And he wrote um, uh, an article which has been published on the James Lynn Library. And in it, he said, um, the current whereabouts of this picture, the original portrait, is unknown. And what that resulted in was that he received an email at that email address from someone who said, I've got it. It had basically disappeared from view for about a hundred years. And the story of um, what happened to it over that time has recently been published. This is the, the portrait itself, in fact, with a, um, an, a photographic image made by um, our photographer son, Theo Chalmers, uh, it's a nice picture. Uh, he wasn't, uh, by um, John Chalmers' account, a first-rate portraitist, but you're not bad. And um, the first time it's actually been published in print 
was on the front cover of the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine in December. And it's a very nice issue, which I urge you to go and have a look at. It has three articles um, in it about James Lynn. The best article, I would say, um, about James Lynn that has ever been uh, written by Ian Mill, the first one. The Strange Disappearances of James Lynn, that's what happened to his body after he died. And George Chalmers' portrait of James Lynn, which tells the story of what happened after it left Hasler Hospital uh, in Gosport uh, and went on his travels. Basically, it went to South Africa and eventually came back to this country three years ago. Um, the people who have been so important in helping to build the James Lind Library are Ian Milne, whom uh, you all know, Estella Ducan, who has been really important uh, in helping me and indeed is a co-author of articles with me, and Ian Donaldson, the honorary librarian, one of the other people to whom uh, all of us owe a great debt for um, protecting the library from uh, vandals uh, who might want to um, sell off its um, valuable contents. So, this is what I'm going to talk about, the evolution of controlled trials before the middle of the 20th century. And there could be at least two other um, titles to the talk conceptualizing and applying the principle of comparing like with like in testing treatments, or the advent of fair treatment allocation schedules in clinical trials during the 19th and early 20th century. Now, why that particular topic? Some of you may remember this um, 1998 um, cover of the, the BMJ, which um, contained several articles marking the 50 years that had passed since the report of the MRC's streptomycin trial in pulmonary tuberculosis was published in the BMJ in 1948. And indeed, that trial is an iconic trial and is sometimes believed to be really the start of clinical trials. Um, probably one of the reasons for that is that um, when a description was made about how patients were allocated to either the streptomycin and bed rest or bed rest alone, um, reference was made to a statistical series based on random sampling numbers drawn up for each sex and each centre by Professor Bradford Hill. And this is the feature of that report which many historians have concentrated on. So, for example, we have Anne Fajolargeau, who's a um, psychiatrist philosopher in Paris, saying that this was the first really randomized controlled trial organized by the MRC under Bradford Hill's uh, guidance, which put into effect in the medical domain the principles of experimentation that had been set out by um, Fisher in agriculture. That's R.A. Fisher. We have J. Rosser Matthews saying, the professional emergence of statistics as a codified body of knowledge and the concomitant rise of individuals trained in its methods provided the necessary conditions for the Laplacian vision of the probabilistically based clinical trial to come into being. What a sentence. <laughs> Harry Marks, um, a much-loved American medical historian whom I knew well and to whom I'm very grateful. The randomized clinical trial is an extension of the statistician, R.A. Fisher's ideas about experimental design. The statistician's randomized controlled trial came to represent the symbol and substance of the statistical method in medicine. Jean-Paul Goudillier, more recently, the history of randomized clinical trials may be traced back to the biometrician's work. There was a direct lineage from Pearson to Bradford Hill via Fisher and Major Greenwood. The basic concepts grounding the choice of randomization 
can be traced back to R.A. Fisher's work. And then Eileen Magnello, who's a historian but who's um, um, previously a statistician, Carl Pearson's 1904 proposal for a clinical trial using alternation to generate comparison groups was a seminal statistical idea. Pearson's statistical methods provided the framework for Bradford Hill's work on the randomized clinical trial. So I'm going to offer an alternative historiography and suggest that, in fact, the concept of unbiased creation of treatment comparison groups wasn't a seminal statistical idea. It was rooted in a much older idea that fair tests of treatments involve comparing like with like. In other words, if you want a fair test of comparison of two treatments, you have to try and make sure that one of the treatments isn't given to people who are really quite ill or much younger, uh, and the other one doesn't have those characteristics. So comparing like with like is a, a pretty fundamental principle. And I started wittering on about this um, 15 years or so ago. And what was really encouraging was that in 2003, my reinterpretation of what had been going on was endorsed by um, the historians who published this article in a book that they were editing. They went on to say, Chalmers takes issue with the current interpretation of the origins of clinical trials that argues that the work of statisticians such as R.A. Fisher was determinant in the acceptance of this practice. Um, Chalmers, in contrast, uncovers a long-standing tradition within medicine of distributing substance subjects through alternation, which shifted easily into randomization. And I felt so pleased that these professional historians had given me the time of day and said that basically I seem to be on to something. It was an enormous um, reassurance. So what I'm, what I'm going to do in, in the, the rest of this talk is I'm going, to, um, I'm going to address a series of issues. First of all, conceptualizing uh, fair comparisons. Then actually putting the conceptualization into practice, using them then securing that they are actually fair, then say a little bit about the historiography of fair comparisons. So let's start with conceptualizing fair comparisons. Petrarch wrote a letter to Boccaccio, another poet, um, in 1364. And Ian Donaldson very kindly translated this um, medieval Italian for me, and this is basically what it says. I solemnly affirm and believe that if a hundred or a thousand men of the same age, same temperament, same surroundings, same time, same disease, in other words, basically establishing that we're talking about comparing like with like, um, that if one half followed the prescriptions of the doctors of the variety of those practicing at the present day and that the other half took no medicine but relied on nature's instincts, I would have no doubt as to which half would escape. Interesting uh, language uh, to use. Um, and then this man, um, or anyway the one in the front of the picture, um, uh, Johannes um, Baptista van Helmont, a Flemish physician, an iatro chemist. Um, again, I'm indebted to uh, Ian Donaldson for helping to uh, understand what he was saying um, when, in what's written there on the, um, printed there on the left, said he was basically challenging the orthodox practitioners who were into bloodletting and purging, which he didn't uh, accept at all as a proper way of treating people. So he said, let us take from the itinerant hospitals, from the camps or from elsewhere, 200 or 500 poor people with fevers, pleurisy, etc., and divide them in two. Let us cast lots, <coughs> randomize, so that one half of them fall to me and the other half to you. I shall cure them without bloodletting or, or perceptible purging. You will do so according to your knowledge, and we shall see how many funerals each of us shall, shall have. 
The outcome of the context, contest shall be the reward of 300 florins, florins deposited by each of us. Which is a nice way of making sure that people are serious about their therapeutic <coughs> claims. And here's um, uh, Mesmer um, <coughs> saying when he was challenged about the effectiveness of his uh, treatment, animal magnetism, saying in order to avoid any later argument, and this is a, 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 a comparison between what the orthodox practitioners uh, would offer and what he would offer, um, and all questions that could be raised about differences in age, in temperament, in diseases, in their symptoms, etc., the assignment of the patient should be made by the method of lots. Again, the, the idea of comparing, um, in fair comparisons, comparing like with like, is very old. And it was conceptualized centuries ago as a um, characteristic of fair uh, treatment comparison. In those particular examples, by um, a poet and a choir. Right, what about actually using fair comparisons? Well, this is something that uh, James Lynn did in the um, study that um, I alluded to briefly earlier. And here again, he was <coughs> conscious of the need to compare like with like. He said, I took 12 patients in the scurvy, their cases were as similar as I could have them, so they were clinically similar. Um, more than that, they lay together in one place and had one diet, basic diet, common to all. In other words, he was holding these factors um, uh, constant and um, what you will all know is that there were six treatments. The, the one recommended by the Royal College of Physicians of London was sulfuric acid. Um, the Admiralty suggested vinegar might be a good idea, but one of the treatments he used was two oranges and a lemon. And those um, sick sailors got better very fast indeed. So what about use of unbiased prospect? Because we don't know how he assigned is 12 patients to each of six treatments. It's not, uh, I, as far as I know, it's not recorded anywhere. But some people did start to do that. And there was an appreciation of the need to compare like with like when people started to use alternation or rotation, even if they weren't using random allocation. And by the way, if you think computers use random allocation, they don't. You have to write out the rhythms to say how people are going to be allocated. It's not true random allocation, which doesn't alter the fact that it's a pretty good uh, basis for doing it. And this is a controlled trial done in 1809 um, during the Peninsula War to assess the effects of bloodletting on camp fever. And it's reported in this um, Edinburgh MD thesis, written by Alexander Lassassier Hamilton, um, about whom Lisa Rosner has written uh, a biography. Uh, the biography is called The Most Beautiful Man in Existence because that is the way that uh, Hamilton himself described himself. Um, and he, he was a bit of a bounder, actually. He cheated on his wife. He was constantly getting into debt. But there are a number of things which suggest that he was also quite obsessional. He was regarded as a good recorder of the patients that he saw. When he moved to a new garrison, he would go to the local library to get um, uh, books to read uh, from there. And what he did when he was at this uh, base hospital in Elvas, which was just over the border from Spain in Portugal, um, there were three surgeons there, and what he arranged was that the, the 366 ill soldiers were admitted alternately in such a matter that each of the three surgeons had one third of the whole of the 366. And again, he's talking about comparing like with like and fair comparisons. The sick were indiscriminately received and were attended as nearly as possible with the same care and accommodated with the same comforts. Neither Mr. Anderson nor I ever once employed the Lancet, 
he lost two I4 cases, that's a mortality of 2.5%, while as, uh, out of the other third, treated with bloodletting by the third surgeon, 35 patients died. In other words, a 10 times greater mortality. Yet, a um, 100 years later, indeed even over 100 years later, Sir William Ozer was still recommending bloodletting for the treatment of pneumonia. Um, here's another really nice example, and I rather like the authorship, A Society of Truth-Loving Men, based in um, Nuremberg. And what was happening here was, you know how the homeopathic dilutions, they take um, something which is meant to give the same symptoms as the person is suffering from, and they dilute it and dilute it and dilute it and dilute it. They um, then did a controlled trial to find out if people administered that could tell the difference between that and pure snow water, in other words, which didn't have any of these um, demons in them. Um, and there were, in fact, several. If, you know, if I'd been a patient uh, ill in the, the 19th century, I would have gone to a homeopath, no doubt about it, on the basis of the evidence that we have. Um, but this, this particular report uh, was written up by the um, and the editor of the local journal, Gail Glerner, and here's some description of what they did. 100 vials, 50 for filling with the potentiation, that's the homeopathic dilution, 50 for filling with pure distilled snow water, labeled consecutively by Dr. Lerner with the numbers 1 to 100, then mixed well amongst each other and placed 50 per table on two tables. Those on the table at the right were filled with the potentiation. Those on the table on the left were filled with pure distilled snow water. Dr. Lerner enters the number of each bottle, indicating its contents in a list, seals the latter, and hands it over to the committee, the members of which also affix their seals. The filled bottles are then brought to the large table in the middle, are once more mixed among each other, and thereupon submitted to the committee for the purpose of distribution. You'd hardly want a more thorough description of random allocation than that. I thought it was great. And Michael Stolberg has written a very nice um, article published in the James Lynn Library, giving more details of that trial, if some of you would like to look that up. Here's another one done in 1854 to test claims that belladonna, as was supposed by some people at the time, would protect children from developing scarlet fever during an epidemic. This man, Thomas Graham Balfour, ended up being a president of the Royal Statistical Society, but came from this part of the world, um, was at the time the medical director in charge of a, um, an orphanage for the orphans of, of soldiers. Uh, and there was, a, there was an epidemic of scarlet fever, so what he decided to do was identify those boys who he was pretty certain had not had the disease, divided them in two sections, and this is the key phrase, taking them alternately from the list to prevent the imputation of selection. In other words, here the actual reason for using alternation is being spelled out by him. Uh, by the way, it didn't show any protective effect, and there are other aspects of that trial which are extremely interesting too. Here's a, a Dane, um, Oscar Banscher, um, saying that if you really want to find out if tracheotomy is a good idea um, for croup, um, let every second croup patient with an indication of tracheotomy remain without the operation, every second undergoing the operation. So again, this, this idea of using alternation um, was becoming more um, uh, um, common. And indeed, the James Lynn Library has um, 25 reports of the use of alternation to generate treatment comparison groups published before 1900. And by the beginning of the 20th century, people started to refer to this as a method so, the, in fact, this, this Italian uh, researcher, writing in German, referred to it as the Alternative Method. 
the uh, Cousin Netta, both referred to it as La Metton Alternante. The alternate case method was uh, used by Choksi, uh, a wonderful Indian researcher, medical researcher from the beginning of the uh, 20th century. Rational alternation he, he used. Alternation by Jesse Bulua, an American physician. The alternate case method by another two uh, Americans. Um, Russell Cecil was the first author of a multi-author textbook of medicine, which is a very famous textbook, Cecil and Loeb, it became. And then Simultan it ordered by Wagner Yavi. Um, so we're seeing now the emergence of um, basically the conceptualization of something which is important as a way of um, making it more likely that the results of the comparison being made are going to be more comparison and more com um, uh, trustworthy because an attempt has been made to compare like with like. And before that iconic trial was published in 1948, there were controlled trials testing all sorts of things. Here, I'm not going to read through these, but they um, were applied to studies in a lot of different infections and a lot of different um, interventions for infections. Here's um, Khan Bahadur, um, I forget what the N stands for, but that's his proper first name really, Choksi. Um, and down in the underlying bit it says the cases were to be taken um, for treatment alternately in the order of admission and without any attempt at exclusion of any sort. This was a, a trial of treatments for plague. And um, uh, Valdemar Hathkain, a, a Russian, also working uh, in India, uh, did this, um, and used the same sort of techniques in, in trials that he did. After all was seated, every second man without further distinction was inoculated. The even numbers, the inoculated were left to live with the uninoculated under conditions identical with those under which they were living before. The first historian to really um, draw attention to this earlier than 1948 history of controlled trials is Scott Podolsky, who is a medically qualified medical historian who works at uh, Harvard. In a, in a really beautiful book called Pneumonia Before Antibiotics, and it was mainly referring to serum treatment for pneumonia. And indeed, there were lots of controlled trials of serum treatment for pneumonia um, in the early part of the 20th century. And Jesse Bulloa, whose name I mentioned previously, stands out as one of the stars of this body of research. If one thinks about what are the um, impressive things about this uh, um, program of research, it involved large numbers of patients and alternations. So here's an example, a study of 1,161 cases where the alternate case method was used. Um, they used statistics to assess the uh, extent to which the differences that have been observed between the comparison groups were likely explained by chance. And here's Jesse Bulua talking about the ratio of the difference in the results of treatment must be, must be twice the standard error. And here's an example taken from a, patient, uh, from a paper showing where those results uh, are presented. But they even did meta-analysis, which is often thought of as something fairly recent. The word itself wasn't uh, um, introduced until 1976 by an American psychologist called Jean Glass. But basically what it does, it takes similar studies uh, done administratively separately and tries to get a, a statistically more robust article by looking at all of the studies together. So here we have um, uh, three hospitals that have done these uh, trials of serum treatment. Type 1 um, streptococcus at the top, type 2 underneath. But the top line is calculating the combined experience of all three hospitals and therefore gives a statistically more robust um, 
uh, Testament. So the conclusion there of this section is that alternation began to be used to create fair treatment comparisons um, at least 200 years ago. What about securing fair comparisons? Because there are problems if you leave it to alternation, pure and simple. Well, um, as you've seen before, stat a statistical series of random sampling numbers was drawn up for each sex in each centre by Professor Bradford Hill for the streptomycin trial. But why were random sampling numbers used? Well, Richard Dole, in a fairly pithy quote, said randomization was introduced to control selection biases, not for any esoteric statistical reason. And one of the most distinguished living statisticians, uh, David Cox, also says um, similar things. Although there are statistical reasons for random allocation in experiments, systematic justification of standard errors and exact tests of significance and associated confidence limits, the most important function of random allocation is to help achieve concealment of an unbiased allocation schedule and thus avoid selection bias in the creation of comparison groups. And the reason that Bradford Hill was on to the importance of this was that he wrote a unpublished and now lost memorandum um, about this study done by the MRC where it was intended that cases seen with pneumonia in London, Edinburgh and Aberdeen would be alternated to serum or not. And basically Aberdeen did it pretty well, London did it pretty well, but Edinburgh cheated. If you're going to use alternation you will get groups of the same size or at most one difference. But there was quite a lot more difference than that between the um, comparison groups in the Edinburgh study. And so he, Bradford Hill was alerted to the possibility that it was possible to cheat, um, probably with the best of intentions. You know, this, this lady who's come up um, uh, is my auntie. Um, I'm worried about this serum. I'm going to put her into the um, non-serum group. Or she's my auntie and I think she deserves the serum treatment because it's looking good. So just as long as you know what the allocation schedule is, it gives you the opportunity to be selective in the way that you assign people to the treatment comparison groups. And so when um, in this now lost internal report for the MRC uh, was um, seen. Uh, Bradford Hill had said greater effort should be taken that the division of, a case, of, of cases really did ensure a random selection. And note that he's, he's using random selection for something which was alternation, despite the fact that alternation isn't random, uh, it's systematic. And so when he wrote his um, very, um, very famous book, it's gone into 12 editions I think, in 1937, bringing together a series of articles The Lancet had asked him to write about the principles of medical statistics. And he was writing about this issue. He said, the reason why in experiments in the treatment of disease, the allocation of alternate cases to the treated and untreated groups is often satisfactory is because no conscious or unconscious bias can enter in, as it may in any selection of cases. And because in the long run, we can fairly rel rely upon this random allotment of the patients to equalize in the two groups the distribution of other characteristics that may be important. So he's using alternation and random allocation as if they are similar, and indeed they are. The thing is, um, you have to be strict about what the allocation schedule says, because if you aren't, then the study design may leak. If you know in advance what the next treatment allocation is going to be, you may decide either not to put someone into a trial or to put someone into a trial. 
And so those allocation schedules need to be concealed. Now, the first decent multicenter MRC trial um, was a trial of, a, of a, an antibiotic called Patulin, um, which was said to be, claimed to be, useful for treating the common cold. And because it was during the war, and because the common cold was resulting in a good deal of sickness absence, it became rather important to find out whether this, this stuff actually made a difference. And as a consequence, uh, a multicenter trial was established very fast, produced results very fast. You don't have to wait terribly long to see the results of a treatment for a common cold. And the people responsible for this were Philip and Ruth Darcy Hart. Uh, that's a picture taken when uh, Philip was 104, still extremely um, clear about the memory of this trial, which I confirmed by looking at um, documents in the National Archive in Kew. And Joan Faulkner, who was, uh, became Joan Doll. She was the field worker for this trial. And here in their description, they say that the medical officer remained ignorant which of the test solutions the patient received, and neither the medical officer nor the nurse uh, knew which contained patulin. The nurse gave out the test solutions in strict rotation. The distinguishing letter of the particular solution given was ringed by the nurse. Everyone had thought we would use alternation, Philip said to me. And we thought we were very clever in setting up a scheme with two patulin groups and two placebo groups, using letters to designate, I think it was QPRS, maybe something like that, PQRS, uh, to designate each of the four groups, then using rotation to allocate people to the different groups. We thought we were doing something completely new. We wanted to muddle people up. In fact, we succeeded in muddling ourselves up. We didn't always remember what the letters stood for. None of us was a statistician, but we felt that the Patulin trial was the first decently controlled trial the MRC had done. And I think I would disagree, I, I would agree with him. It was a fantastic designed trial. Um, now he, Philip Darcy Hart, was one of the people that went on to form the team of, of three principal people who did the streptomycin trial. Bradford Hill you've already heard about. Mark Daniels was the main field worker. He died tragically young in his 30s from a primary carcinoma of uh, the liver. And there was someone called Mrs. Shireen Agnew, who was the administrative assistant for the trial. And all I've been able to find out about her was that her husband, who was a general practitioner in the um, East End, was a very bad flute player. <laughs> apart from that, I don't know anything about Shireen Agnew. Um, so the really key thing about this study was that the details of the allocation series was unknown to any of the investigators or to the coordinator and contained in a set of sealed envelopes, each bearing on the outside only the name of the hospital and the number. So the historical importance of this streptomycin trial isn't its use of random sampling numbers to generate the schedule. It's its clear description of the precautions taken to conceal the schedule and so secure unbiased allocation. So strict alternation actually deals with selection bias just as effectively as strict, strict random allocation, but alternation is more likely to result in people knowing what the next allocation is going to be and making it possible for people to cheat. And indeed, if you look at trials which have used um, concealed allocation and compare them with trials that haven't used concealed allocation, you find that they generate different results, as was shown in this paper um, many years later, 1995. The, the only paper I've been a co-author with three statisticians, very daunting for an innumerate person like me. And indeed, if you look at the extent to which um, alternation continues to be used, it does continue to be used. It's getting a little bit less now, but not everyone uses random allocation, and indeed those people who claim to use random allocation, who claim to use it, don't always use it. But at least people who use alternation describe alternation, that's what they were using. And 
in the day, there are problems. I mentioned the, that um, computers don't actually generate a random allocation. And the way that mistakes are being made now is that the programmers that are designing the computer programs to assign people to different treatments in controlled trials sometimes make mistakes. And um, this was a paper describing three such instances, one of which uh, the a trial had to be started from scratch because this programming error was found in the algorithm that was being used to um, allocate the patients. So the conclusion of that section is that concealment of allocation schedule is, is required to secure treatment comparisons. Now what about the, the history of fair comparisons? Well, I hope that I've persuaded you that compared with those um, assertions that I showed you from five, was it, historians saying that random, tri random allocation uh, came from R.A. Fisher and agricultural research, that in fact there is a different story. There is very little uh, evidence to support the first interpretation and really quite a lot of evidence, some of which I've shown you, to support the second interpretation, that it is based on a long history of recognizing that like has to be compared with like. And what's interesting is that the historical accounts of clinical trials that have been written that actually draw attention to this have actually been written by people who are medically qualified and have an interest in history. John Bull, whom I met before he died, did an MD thesis on it, but then published this paper in the journal Chronic Diseases at the end of the 50s. Abe Lilienfeld, he actually called his article uh, Ceteris Paribus, um, other things being equal. Um, I've mentioned Scott Podolsky's book. Um, this is Martin Edwards' uh, book on therapeutic trials. And Linda Bryder, a historian and New Zealander, in fact, who had written a book about the MRC in the interwar period. Um, I asked her if she would review the more recent evidence and to give her her due, she said, despite my and Joe Norstocker's claim in 1989 that the MRC's Therapeutic Trials Committee frequently sought expert opinion from the Statistical Committee, and in particular from Greenwood and Bradford Hill, subsequent researchers have found little evidence of such interaction. Ben Toth, looking at the same era, said that as far as the MRC Therapeutic Trials Committee uh, was concerned, it didn't organize a single rigorous comparative clinical trials despite prima facie evidence of the problems of not doing so, none of the factors that were later to be recognized as vital to producing meaningful evaluations of therapies were advocated by the Therapeutic Trials Committee. Yet, there's this little island of well-done research in Glasgow. As far as I know, no one has written about it. But Tom Anderson and uh, I gather he's known as Snoddy, uh, did some very nice alternate allocation trials of streptomycin treatments. But they've never been written up. They, they sent their reports to the MRC, uh, but as far as I can see, they have been inadequately acknowledged. And given that this is the year that um, marks the centenary of the formation of what was called the Medical Research Committee, to begin with, it's very sad to me that there's really no recognition uh, in what I've read from the MRC, that they're going to celebrate the MRC's um, important role, particularly in the immediate post-Second World War period, in the development of clinical trials. It doesn't seem to be something which they feel able to be proud of. Now, there are new opportunities for data collection if you're starting, if you, if you want to go further into the, um, the history of clinical trials. Um, this is where um, Estella Dutan became extremely helpful to those of us who wanted to learn more. You can now do digital searches of the full text of some journals, BNJ, Lancet, New England Journal of Medicine, um, JAMA, uh, Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine, or Proceedings of the Royal Society of Medicine. And that allows one to use search terms, which um, Estella um, uh, developed, 
and to go off and look for reports that are of interest in the respects I've been talking about, really um, back to the middle of the um, 19th century. And once you do that, you actually find that there are lots of them out there. I don't know what proportion of all articles these represent, and certainly I don't know what proportion of articles to do with the, the assessment of treatment, but um, once you have the means to look for them um, more thoroughly, it, it, it opens up that possibility of research. And they're done all over the place, and they're done in all sorts of um, uh, different areas. You have pregnancy and childbirth. Um, this one, for example, finding out whether it really is a good idea to shave women at the beginning of labor. And it turns out not to be. It actually makes their recovery after childbirth less comfortable and more likely to be somewhat infected. Um, nutrition and growth, there were controlled trials in that. Unpolished versus polished rice for preventing beriberi was studied in a um, lunatic asylum in Kuala Lumpur by a man called William Fletcher. Um, and he showed that polished rice predisposed to um, beriberi. Um, miscellaneous ones, uh, the one I've selected uh, to show you is surgery for mental illness. Probably most of you won't know um, that surgery was used quite extensively in some places for people with psychotic illness. Uh, and it wasn't on their head. Um, it's been written up uh, by uh, a historian of, of psychiatry called Andrew Skull. And here is how Mrs. Blake's bad teeth made her murder her son. Um, it was at a time, rather as we have now, a belief that there must be a gene for most things, um, bacterial theory of disease had been established by Pasteur. Everyone thought that probably bugs were responsible for everything, including psychotic illness. And the, so the hunt for the bug went on, and people used surgery not only to do tonsillectomies, to do um, hysterectomies, to do uh, total um, uh, um, eventulation, uh, but also colectomies because there were foci of infections in the large bowel. And some of these were the uh, operative mortality of, of uh, 20 or 30 percent. So, some good people did a controlled trial, asked the question, if we alternate mentally ill patient to surgery or not, can we detect any benefit for the surgery group? did the, um, uh, a trial where they used um, alternate patients and they were unable to um, detect any benefit from this surgical treatment for psychiatric disease. And um, as far as I, I don't know of an earlier trial of using alternation, either a surgery or of treatment for a psychiatric illness. I think this is 1923, I think. Simon Wesley, a professor at uh, the, the Maudsley, recently knighted actually, um, has written a wonderful essay on the James Lynn Library about this. So there's still a lot to learn about the history of fair treatment comparisons. These are the conclusions that I've gone through as I've tried to persuade you with evidence that um, they are justified. Um, it's nice that there are people who are interested in trying to get to the um, get further into this history, and it, it really does um, require um, people with a variety of language skills. And now in the civil library, we're, we're lucky to have uh, Ian Donaldson um, with Latin and French. Um, but we need people with <coughs> German and Danish and other things. And a, a group of us got together to look at the methodological developments, um, the evolution of those methods in assessing the effects of treatments uh, for diphtheria. And um, that group included uh, going from left to right, a French woman, a Swiss, a Dane, a Frenchman, an Englishman, 
an American me. And it was a very enjoyable process because clearly we couldn't have got anywhere near understanding the Danish material unless um, Christian Good had been involved. So that's where I'm going to end. Um, I hope that what I've said has been of some interest to you. If you want to go and look at some of this material, then that's the web address to go and look at it. But thank you very much indeed for hearing me out. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.